Okay, so thank you very much for being here in this session. Um, we are, this, is a, this presentation is a result of some talks that we have had in this project uh, on behalf of uh, Open Geo Hub, Beatriz Arabia and Viola, Creaf Diego de la Vega and Inyasa Evelina and me on what we can do specifically for the project to make sure that we represent better the role of women in Earth observation and policy. Uh, that's the reason why we wanted to put this presentation as a keynote, uh, especially to get this discussion going with you guys and to get your feedback. So the presentation is going to entail first a story that I will tell because I love stories, as John said it yesterday nicely and uh, Gilberto also very nicely uh, demonstrated. There's nothing better for humans than story. So I will start with that. Then I will explain a little bit the background behind the story. So then, hopefully, if everything works uh, well, uh, to do uh, an exercise to get feedback from you for the project. OK, so ready? Here goes the story. I, I have the... There. Thank you. <laughs> OK, so um, I will tell you the story of Maria Garcia that you can see here. Maria Garcia was born in the small rural town of Tandamandapio, Mexico. There you go. Where the sun rose over the fields of corn and beans, just like you see in the picture. <laughs> Growing up, Maria was surrounded by the natural beauty of the land, which sparked her curiosity about the earth and its intricate systems. Maria loved the planet around her. She dreamed of becoming a scientist but not just a scientist, an Earth observation scientist. Every time she told her family about her aspirations, the mother, the mother and the father just looked at her and said, no, mm, I don't know. Why would you go to do such weird things, you know, think, do all these education things, when actually we need you around the help, around the house for the family income? She was determined, so she went to school, she excelled in her studies, earned a scholarship to go abroad and study mathematics at the Virginia State College of the United States of America. She got her Bachelor of Science there, and this was a significant achievement uh, for someone with her background, her color of skin, and her place of birth. She was the first in the family to go to a university. She was the first woman to leave her, her town for this reason. And she was the f one of the few women who studied uh, science or technology or STEM in her close circle of, prof of professional women, colleagues, and friends. However, when she arrived at the university, she was confronted with a classroom environment dominated by people who did not look like her, like her for many reasons, not just the students, but also the professors. So despite her enthusiasm and knowledge, her ideas were frequent, fre frequently overshadowed by her peers. Because you know, you know what they say, girls aren't good at math or science. Many times as she raised her hand to share her insights, she felt the weight of their condescension, making her question her abilities of the validity of her passion for Earth observation. Am I good enough for this? Is this really me? Is this who I should become? Maria also struggled with the absence of female, roles, female role models in her field. She had no mentor. In her search for guidance, she found few women in leadership positions because most of the professors were men. And their experiences, as good as they were and as amazing that these people were, it, it was just unrelatable. She turned to books, of course, for inspiration. Uh, she worked so, several jobs. And she looked for stories of successful female scientists and met successful women that gave her the discipline and the skills that she needed. But still, she continued to doubt her potential. She um, persevered, and after time, she decided to join groups of um, ins institutional groups of, of women who did things like her. For example, she found the UNESCO's Women in Science program, where she found a mentor, finally. This mentor helped her graduate with honors and also secure her an internship at a, promin a, pro a prominent Earth Observation Agency in Europe. When she was in this agency in Europe, she used her platform to advocate for more inclusive hiring practices 
and mentorship programs for young women in STEM, hoping to pave the way for future generations. Okay, so there's the story. Uh, you might wonder right now, of course, if the story is uh, fiction, and of course it is. In fact, it's not just fiction. I asked ChatGPT. I am having a lot of ChatGPT, a lot of fun with ChatGPT right now because of Stefan, <laughs> Stefan's introduction to this amazing invention of the human. And the thing with ChatGPT, as you know, is uh, what you input into the story, right? So this is a story made by ChatGPT with the following input. First, I asked for what is the, more, the most generic name for a woman in the world right now? And the answer, surprisingly, was Maria Garcia. <laughs> so I didn't make this name up. It was actually really interesting because I'm Mexican. You know, I, I can relate to this name. So that was fun. Um, the second thing I asked is about the, the place, but that didn't fit. So this is uh, a random uh, picture of some town in Mexico. And the town from Mandapio also doesn't exist. It's actually a very famous town in a very famous Mexican show. But what does exist are the women that make up the story. So what ChatGPT did is that I input uh, the, the stories of several women in Earth observation that have made already some major achievements, as you will see. And then uh, ChatGPT condensed that story in the story that you heard. So the story that you heard is actually the experiences that are published in the internet of these women. as, as as they have themselves told it. Who are these women? Elena Ochoa, so she was the first Latina woman to go to space. She's actually from Mexico, from Sonora, so that's why Mexico is also represented in the story. Irene Fischer, a woman from Vienna. She was an immigrant, that's why immigration is represented in the story. And she was the leader in the construction of the world geodetic system. Gladys West, the hidden figure of satellite geodesy. She was the one that uh, graduated in mathematics with honors in Virginia State College in the United States. And Christina Koch and Jessica Meyer, uh, which were the first females spacewalk in the International Space Station in 2019, who reflect a lot of the other parts of the story. So what I wanted to get with this story is the context, the context that we all know uh, of how what hardships women have, not just joining Earth observation, but also um, STEM in general. So a little bit, uh, see what we have to do as a project. There were several studies, and I didn't want to get into the science, because science, unfortunately, is a little bit sometimes too boring to, to say you know, numbers and, and acronyms. <laughs> but I wanted to get a little bit the explanation, so why this happens, right? So there's a lot of science about it. I really like this survey, this is actually uh, this organization, Women in Copernicus, asking in 2020 several women who are already in Earth Observation working, what do they think are the major barriers to their uh, professional adv advancement in the past or in the future? And it's a, it's a ranking, so uh, number five is the most, and that's why the first one will be the highest. So as you can see, the stereotypes in society is the number one reason why women feel that they have not been able to advance, and this, as you see, is clearly reflected in the story, and so on. Missing female role models, culture, what the women should do, lack of self-confidence because of the result of all the other barriers, differences in education, Mexico versus Europe, and uh, wording, and how people phrase things. Okay, so that's the end of my presentation. I wanted to make it very, very um, small uh, because what I want to do is actually get our hands working to get your feedback. So I will ask you three questions. Uh, please, exactly, do as you already are doing to scan the Mentimeter. Let's hope that it works. <laughs> let, let me know uh, who is not there yet. Is, is somebody not inside of the app? Okay, we can wait some two minutes. Okay, somebody not there yet? It seems everybody there. <laughs> go ahead, okay. Okay, and now we can go to the Mentimeter. Let's see, it works, I'm excited. <laughs> yes, oh, okay, so, oh, wow, you guys are fast. <laughs> okay, so first, because we're scientists, we like to do quizzes. I was going to give you data, but instead I'm going to ask you what percentage of the 
Earth observation workforce do you think is female? Exactly, people are answering, so let's give 10 seconds for people who haven't answered to still think about it or change your answer, <laughs> if it's possible. We don't have any sounds. In, we have here, we had here last year a YASA festival where somebody had a menti and they had sounds, and people were just getting crazy, like sending cow sounds and everything. So we don't have that now, thankfully. <laughs> okay, I think everybody answered. And you got it right, nice. So you're right, 28% of the entire Earth Observation workforce is, is female. So as you can see, it's less than a third. So we still have a lot of work to do. We can go to the next one. Yes. Okay, so why 28%? We already talked a, lo a little bit the story encompasses a, lot of, a, a little bit about these reasons. I gave you some of the survey responses uh, that this article had. But I want, you, I want you to know, I want to know from you, in your experience, why do you think it's 28%? What have you experienced in your professional development, in your institutions, that could be one biggest barrier that you can think for women in the earth observation field? So you can text it and we will get a, a word cloud, if we're lucky. You can use a code, exactly. You can go to Google, uh, click Menti, go to the website, and put that number. OK, nice, nice, it works. So we're getting some feedback. Stereotypes is there, exactly. Lack of self-confidence. Not popular curriculum, exactly. Mother's duty. OK, stereotypes, OK. We begin to converge into something. OK, I will wait uh, 20 minutes because people are still, 20 minutes, 20 seconds, people are still, are still adding something. And based on this, we will go to the next question, which, which we want to see of, based on these barriers that you guys are seeing here and the ones that you, you think are the most important, what can we do in the project? Because what we want to do is, in the OAMC project, for those of you who are actively right now in the project, or even then, in your, in your own institutions, of course, we can have the project and then just comply with the European Union, right? Say, yeah, 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 we'll just, we'll just tick the box of, of the gender dimension of research, right? <laughs> we can do that. But we want to do better than that. And to have a real impact in, in the project or in, in our institutions, then what, what, how is it? Uh, what, what do we need to measure? What do we need to focus? And how little can we advance so that we go back to the European Union after the OEMC project and we can say, Yes, we, managed, we, wa we wanted to grasp this part of our project for improving uh, women's representation, and we managed to do it, right? So we see here that the most important barriers, according to experiences, um, stereotypes, social system, lack of self-confidence, work-life balance, very good, not popular. We can go to the next one, and, that, and last one. Now, focusing, for those of you who are in the project, or, or if not, in your own institutions, what do you think we can do? Like real activity. So let's, 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 let's get very, very practical for the project to help increase our gender representation, which doesn't necessarily mean hire more women, women, of course, but we can do many other things. This feedback that you give us now is going to help us as uh, part of the work package activities in crafting the report and the material that we will eventually uh, uh, submit to the um, European Union. So. We will take um, three minutes for you to think this really, really as much as, 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 as deep as possible um, to, to get that very nice report going. <laughs> yeah, it's a hard one. Okay, thank you, thank you. Nice, super nice feedback. Hackathon! Wow! <laughs> but how would a, how would a hackathon uh, work? That's a, that's a good one, though. Who wrote hackathon? Can you guys, if you guys are, want to say something about what you were thinking? No? 
Well, I mean, an idea that I have now, uh, which we also have, of course, for the hackathon and the conference, is to make sure that we include, that we invite women, right? But then it's, it's really hard because uh, for many reasons that I'm not even going to. But then what we can see is, okay, could in the hackathon uh, maybe more topics be included or relevant uh, problems that could include some type of gender, right? So um, that, that was a very good suggestion, in fact, to, in a very practical way. We do have a hackathon next year. So maybe whoever is going to organize the hackathon can get together with us to think together these this, this different aspects of, of what we can do better in this way. Hire a woman, exactly. Actively engage. It's friendly, outreach. Okay, nice, thank you guys. Okay, that makes us very happy as <laughs> work package that we have a lot of your feedback. Perfect. Stop toxic masculinity. Yeah, toxic masculinity, but I mean toxicity is also everywhere. But yeah, I get you. Facilitate women participation. It's nice that hire women was the, the first one. <laughs> That's very straightforward. Actively engaged. Okay, guys, thank you very much. I think that, that closes our very, very fruitful and useful presentation. Thank you very much.